Hello and welcome to Women in Ministry TV. I'm Jacqueline Battle, and I'm happy that you've joined me this week. Before we do anything, let's approach the throne of God. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for this opportunity to be able to minister. It's an opportunity and we're grateful. We thank you, Father, in Jesus Christ's name, that your word will flow freely, unhindered by any satanic or demonic force, that you will think through my mind and speak through my vocal cords, that it be all of you, and, and I'm trusting, oh God, in the name of Jesus, that my soul yields itself as dependent upon your spirit. We acknowledge your presence. We receive your presence, and we thank you that in your presence, you're ministering to our souls. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're watching right now, I want to say to anyone who's watching who has not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to do that. The only reason why I do what I do is so that souls can be joined to the kingdom of God. It's important. And why is it important? Because God is grace and the grace of God not only teaches you, the grace of God empowers you. Man born of a woman is going to have tribulations. I don't care whether you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior or not. The issue is that as you accept him as your Savior, you receive his presence. And his presence makes all the difference in the world. So that no matter what you're going through, you're not going through it alone. And I can assure you that in his presence, there's fullness of joy. In his presence, there's wholeness, there's deliverance, there's answer, there's consolation, there's peace, there's solace. I want you to accept Jesus as your Savior. Because he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. And the chastisement of your peace, your shalom, your wholeness is upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Is your life always going to be a bed of roses? No, it's not a bed of roses for anyone. The difference is being alone or being in the presence of God, having the presence of God with you. For it is written in Matthew 28, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He promised to be with you. And his presence, there's power. It's not just him being with you, but in his presence, there's a provision of everything that you need to be self-reliant upon him, or will I say dependent upon him rather than self-reliant, dependent solely upon him. Because as you live, you begin to realize that there are no real answers. There are things that are available that will work in certain circumstances and situations. But you're going to get to a time where those things that you've been working or using don't work anymore. But in his presence, there's fullness. So I invite you right now. If you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior, I want you to accept him. Because his presence makes all the difference. And in his presence, there's a grace that allows you to approach the throne of grace boldly and obtain mercy and find a grace to help, a grace for healing, a grace for deliverance, a grace for courage, a grace to put one foot in front of the other and keep moving forward. That takes grace, grace to get over offense, grace to forgive, grace to be forgiven, grace to forgive yourself. It's all in Christ Jesus. Pray this prayer with me. Our Father in heaven, we believe your love. We thank you for your son, Christ Jesus. We thank you for him being wounded for our transgressions. Father God, we know that we have sinned, but we thank you for providing forgiveness and mercy and grace at your throne. We come now to the foot of your throne and we accept Christ as Savior. We accept his death, burial, and resurrection for our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight, the scripture that I want us to look at is in Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 26. And it reads this way. Therefore, if thy bring to the altar 
thy gift. And there remember that thy brother have all against thee. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge and the judge deliver thee to the officer and thou be cast in, into prison. Verily, I say unto thee, thou shalt in no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. We've been talking about the spirit of offense and how when we enter into the spirit of offense, we create a path for the enemy to come in and suppress our ear to be able to hear what the spirit is saying. The spirit of God is always speaking to us. Once we accept him as Lord and Savior, once we begin to meditate on his word day and night, we can begin to sense his presence. And even when we can't sense his presence, he's with us. Even when we don't know that he's there, his presence is there because we invite his presence when we accept him as our savior. We willingly invite our souls and our inner man to be free to, to hear what the spirit is saying, to communicate with the spirit to commune, to have kononia, relationship with his spirit. So his presence is there. But when we get into offense, we hinder the path that we have neurologically and spiritually in our inner man to connect with our souls and to minister. We literally yield that path to evil and to spirits that can influence us, they can't possess us because we're possessed by Christ Jesus and his spirit once we accept him as Lord and Savior. But they can certainly influence us because now the path that we have to hear what the spirit is saying has been obstructed. That's what the spirit of offense does. It literally cuts off our ability to hear as our Lord and Savior is constantly, compassionately, graciously ministering to us and pleading our cause and fighting against them that fight against us. We can't hear that. So in this text, and this is the original Hebrew um, translation that I'm about to read. Uh, and it makes it even more plain as we read it. And over the weeks, we're going to be talking about a little bit more about who this judge is, how he comes about. And what his job is when he comes through. Um, I don't want to mix things up now. So I'm going to read the original text or the, the um, translation. It says, be well in intention toward your opponent quickly while you are in the way with him. That the opponent not deliver you to the judge and the judge deliver you to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you that in no way means shall you come out from there until you have paid the utmost cataracts. Here's what we're dealing with or quadrants. Here's what we're dealing with. If you can remember the story of the children of Israel and when they were held captive in Egypt. And I use this story because it's so prevalent and, and so apparent that when the time of judgment had come and they had been in bondage for hundreds of years, but when the time of judgment arrived, the spirit that was used to execute the judgment was the spirit of death. In the course of heaven, it had been decided that they would be judged for how they had treated God's people. And as generation and generation and generation passed and Moses was born, God had him transported so that he could be raised in the palace and learn all the intricate details of their perspective and their mindset and their communication. Because how many of you know that if you have a perspective or a neurological uh, pathway or a paradigm that's opposite to what you're trying to reach, you'll never be able to reach it. 
So God allowed him to be taught in the palace. He allowed all of that to transpire. Then he allowed him to go to the wilderness. You know, those things happened. He got exiled. He went to the wilderness. To the, um, to the wilderness. All of that happened. All of that that he went through with the with the sheep in the wilderness and the desert. All of that. And when the in the fullness of time, when it was time for that judgment to be executed, Moses was called. He received his calling by, by being impressed from the presence of God that was moving through a burning, burning bush that was not consumed, which is what caught Moses' attention. I need you to know that there is a season for everything. The word of God tells us that to everything, there's a season. He tells us in Genesis um, 1 verse 14 that literally he's got signals and times already set up, seasons already set up. And at, he reveals them to us uh, in the firmament and as the times change. Well, this was a season. And in this season, judgment executed and the spirit of death came to deliver and execute that judgment. And nothing could stop the spirit of death but the blood of Jesus. That blood on the doorpost indicated to the spirit of death that death had already passed through there. So death didn't come through the door because judgment had already been executed. Death had a job and nothing was going to stop death. Nothing was going to stop until everything had been completed according to exercising this judgment. I need you to understand that there is a judgment for our actions. There is a consequence for our actions. There is reciprocity. Uh, there is there is something that uh, comes around that we reciprocate from our actions. And when we enter into offense, because of the spiritual detriment that it creates, the fire that it sends out, the souls that it deteriorates, and the health, eternal and temporal, that it deteriorates, God judges the spirit of offense. He judges everything, but he judges the spirit of offense. And he's telling you right here, the judge in the courts of heaven will release a judgment. And I know people say, well, we're under grace now. So what are you saying? What are you saying, battle? Because we're under grace. Yes. We are under grace and we can approach the, the, the throne of grace and find, uh, attain mercy and find a grace to help in everything that we need. But I need you to understand that there is a consequence to every one of our actions. And that con consequence is what's being called the judge here. And when that judge goes forth, he goes forth to deliver you to whatever spirit has been assigned to carry out the completing and the execution of the judgment that has to do with the offense. And I know that it's, it's difficult to understand because we're talking about a gracious, loving, compassionate God. And we're talking about the dispensation of grace that we live in. And sometimes we forget that our actions have consequences. And these are, are, are principles that have already been set up. So we're not looking at a God that is sitting there saying, oh, you did this, I'm going to do this to you. You did this. No. When we decide to take a certain stance, to say certain things, to behave a certain way, to ingest certain things, when we do that, we immediately eat and invoke whatever the consequence is. There's a consequence for every one of our actions. And so when we take a step in a particular direction, if we're heading north and we keep walking in that direction, we're going to end up somewhere that's north. If we're trying to get somewhere that's south, but we're heading in the direction that's north, we're not going to get to our destination that's south. And we'll get to our destination in the north and be upset. Lord, I wanted to be in the south. Why didn't you help me? Why didn't grace much more abound where sin about? Because your feet kept heading in the direction of north. And because your feet kept heading in the direction of north, you receive the consequence, the judgment 
of your feet continuing to head in the direction of north. Well, offense has a judgment. Unforgiveness has a judgment. Matter of fact, in Mark, in, the, uh, in Mark chapter 11, we're told in verse 25 that we are to forgive because if we don't forgive, then our, heaven, our Father, which is in heaven, cannot forgive our trespasses. And a trespass is when someone reaches into your soul, infringes into your boundaries, encroaches into your life, and takes something. And yet the word is for you without a price tag. And so when we deal with the spirit of offense, we need to understand that there are repercussions for offense. When we hold someone in offense, and we'll talk about that more in the future. But right now, discusses agreeing with your adversary. We're not talking about being doormats. Neither are we talking about consistently being mistreated. But we are talking about our intentions because judgment is based on our intentions. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the word of God says God looks at the heart. He looks at whether or not in your heart you believe one thing and yet with your mouth and, and your expressions, you express something else. He looks at you pretending that you agree with someone or that you like someone or that you are complimentary towards someone when in your heart you really are saying something else as a man thinks in his heart so is he and if there's offense in your heart that's who you are and it's creating a barrier that hinders you so again here the translation says be well intentioned towards your opponent quickly while you are in the way with him so that that opponent, opponent won't deliver you to the judge. See, because what happens when you create offense, there's something called negative observatory energy. Matter of fact, now there are certain scientists that when they conduct an experiment in the lab, it used to be that people can come in and observe, but now they begin to close off the observatory areas so that as they conduct the experiment, no one's negative observatory energy can have an effect on the outcome of the experiment. So if there is an, uh, uh, someone that's looking at it and they're thinking that this won't work, because of their understanding of all of the parameters involved in the lab experiment, it can have an effect. Their neurological energy can have an effect on that outcome. When we offend someone, their neurological observatory energy can have an effect towards our lives. It releases forces and principalities that go forth to create contention and to hinder. Matter of fact, it gives them a path into your life. It gives them a segue to hinder and to create sins and walls that now have to be remitted, penalties that have to be broken. And yet this says here that the issue is with offense, you're not going to get released until the entire judgment has been paid. I'm going to stop here and say to you, be quick to agree with your adversary while you are in the way with him or her. If you have to approach the throne of grace, obtain mercy and ask God to give you the grace to forgive, do that. If you have to pray and ask God to give them the grace to forgive, do that. And as you continue to meditate on words of encouragement, on words of light, on the word of God, day and night, observing to do all according to that is written therein, he promises, according to Joshua 1, 8, that he will make your way prosperous and he will have good success. Let us pray for the grace 
to overcome and to avoid the snare of offense. Well, that's all for this week. I invite you to surprise yourself and listen to and, and, and enjoy and feast on the messages that come from all of those who are part of this platform. Thank you again for joining us. Have a good night.